question I have to ask, maybe uh, too compendious for you to answer in the time we have available, but uh, I feel compelled to ask it nevertheless so that we can start the, um, uh, uh, well, the analysis. And it's this, that, and it ties in with what you've just said about none of the trusts that you examined in the northwest London area achieved the proposed, and that's how you've written it down in here, emergency standards. Now, I want to take this in, in stages. Before the proposed standards, obviously there was a, another standard. Because otherwise, you, you wouldn't be talking about proposed standards, I don't think. Now, if there's a difference, what is the difference? Secondly, to what extent did the trusts fail to meet the proposed standards? In other words, was it all the same? Because you mentioned particularly at the beginning of, of your evidence on-site consultants and radiology. Now, are those the standards that you're talking about, or was there much more that I'm missing here? So, do you see the thrust of the question? I see precisely. So, it is, um, well, I think I do. The book you were writing about, Jeff. The first thing to say is that I didn't say that it was the, most of the trusts in Northwest London, this was most of the trusts in London. Yes, it is. It was London wide. And secondly, it is right for me to say that prior to the attempts, the congruent attempts of the College of Surgeons of England and Healthcare for London, as it then was, prior to their attempts to derive standards, there were no standards. So these, this is the first proposition, the first and only proposition of standards. This arose because of the report by our friends in journalism about the dangers of entering a London hospital, a hospital in London, over the weekend with an acute surgical condition. And I'm sure you will remember that this was five or six years ago. Um, and Healthcare for London and the Public Service picked up on this and responded. And hence, those proposals were the first proposals. Well, I have a supplementary. Uh, and that is, I instead of reducing sites, was it considered by the board as a possibility of raising all the hospitals to the same standard? A very good supplementary question. I think all doctors, all surgeons, and particularly those groups of us who are in some of these days, would clearly take that view. The view that you just increase the staff level. But of course, when you're only dealing with a population of perhaps 200,000 catchment population, maybe 180,000, as is typically the case in Northwest South if you're going to meet the emergency standards and have sufficient numbers of consultant staff, both radiologists and uh, surgeons, and some specialty surgeons, interestingly alluded to by the previous witness, then you don't have anything for them to do that isn't emergency in their elective lives. Now this is partially a problem because of self-specialization. And this is fundamental actually. This supplemental question is fundamental. When I started at the Western Mid Service Hospital, there were five total potential surgeons. And we did, so I was appointed as a urologist and a general surgeon. The general surgeon, one of the other general surgeons, happened to do most of the breast work. But his colleagues did this as well. The vascular surgeon did most of the vascular surgery, but also the general surgeon. So with a catchment of a couple of hundred thousand, we were in the West Middlesex, five surgeons produced a unified on-call rotor. And because they were sharing what are now subspecialty interests, there was enough work to go around to maintain the skills. As soon as you say we have breast surgeons and they just do breast surgery, we have colorectal surgeons and they just do colorectal, the urologists have gone off in a separate tribe many years ago, the vascular surgeons have just split from the general surgeons, then in order to have sufficient 
tribes and sufficient numbers of people, because you can't just have one in a tribe, you know, it's immediately free. You've suddenly got 15 consultants on one site for a population of 180,000. Now, if that's the only hospital and that's the catchment and the next one is 70 miles away, well, then so be it. But in terms of a dense population of 1.8 million in the Northwest Thames, to raise the standard to the proposed criteria for each of that unit, and I speak for surgery and emergency surgery, is not a sensible politician, irrespective of money. Now, there may be unintended consequences of, of stopping the other equally important medical activities. And uh, I preface my remarks by, by crediting um, what I thought was wonderful statement from the previous witness. So I'm well aware that I'm only really talking about the exactly. fragment of the totality. Um, can I, can I, just to take it a different way around, if we can, I mean, presumably you're saying for, to have a full range of those different sub subspecialties in a team to deliver services, you need a certain expanded catchment population. <coughs> but I'm also right in thinking that if you have that expanded population and these teams working effectively, then you would also need a certain number of beds to go with that in order to ensure that they could actually place their patients for recovery having operated on them. Absolutely. And yeah. I mean, so yeah. there's a bit of a cut trade-off between um, reconfiguring to reduce the number of hospitals and numbers of beds, and at the same time bringing catchments together so you get more surgeons. Sure. So do you, if I'm the line of question, the very important question, and you can see I'm very interested in health care, a very important question, which is if you do it better and by that time you do it better for surgery, and indeed my colleagues in orthopedic surgery have uh, um, an initiative at the moment, which is the paraphrase of which is get it right first time. So if you do get it right first time and you have the resources to get it right first time, your question is do you actually say right? Therefore, that's the answer is probably you do. Whether you do to the extent of which it is necessary to say that you do to make up some of it, I don't know. I'm not going to count it nor a politician. I mean, it wasn't quite what I was saying. I wasn't actually talking about money. I was talking about the fact that if you reconfigure hospitals to take one out, or in this case, take four hospitals out of the frame in northwest London, and we are now looking at the plans as drawn up involve a thousand fewer beds in northwest London. So if you take those beds out, but you've then got these bigger teams of surgeons uh, able to deliver services, will they have the beds to put the patients in? I do remember a couple of years ago, a number of years ago now, it was a joint report, I think it was the Royal College of Surgeons and BMA and some others, who got together and proposed a much bigger catchment, so like a million and a half, two million or something. But they never drew the conclusions to how big the hospitals needed to be to enable them to actually treat the catchment that they had. So, it would not be unreasonable to say that you must really provide the same number of beds that you are currently using. Though all of us would suspect that there would be two consequences of centralization. This is a suspicion. The first is that we as surgeons would become more adventurous and we would operate on more people. The second is that probably within that, we would also do it better, right, first time, more senior people, getting to the patient <coughs> sooner, having made the diagnosis by cross-sectional imaging, and not allowing them to language for 24 hours or over a weekend. So we would do it better, but at the same time, we probably do more of it. I suspect, in terms of beds and resources, it would end up as neutral. <coughs> However, I'm getting a little bit off piece here, so I must be careful. Who's piece are we talking about? Mine. <laughs> 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 um, could I keep you off piece then? Um, <coughs> only because you're afraid. <coughs> um, uh, 
I happen to know that you've got a wide experience. Can I be heard? Yes. Uh, a wide experience um, beyond the narrow, the narrow compounds you've talked about today. Would you mind if I ask you a question based on your previous experience? Because I'd like to explore a little bit of how out of our out of hospital uh, services will maybe reduce admissions, because that is what is what I would like to believe as part of SHF. And to that end, can I call on your experience? Because I have to know, you, you were a pioneer of running outreach clinics, which you did without the war, uh, back in a place I know very well, 25 years ago. I remember you telling me at that time you wanted to do it because you wanted to make the decisions as a consultant first. And although we didn't audit it, it came, we, we did discover that yes, you could probably reduce outpatient uh, attendances by firstly educating us and secondly because you were making decisions. Now, assuming a consultant is available to make the decisions, do you really think the outreach clinics actually prevent admissions. They might prevent outpatient attendance, but they actually prevent admissions. I can give an example for more. So very am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What is the what is that? Yeah. It's a very um, interesting point. I think that the answer to that question is probably yes. Because, of course, you avoid the patients getting into a system which might, I'm being frank here, which might actually do them harm. Might worry them that there is something the matter with them when there isn't. They may be attended to overzealously, or they may not be attended to zealously enough. Um, they, might, they might be, once they get out of a consultant base, and indeed, primary care-based environment, it may not be quite the same, contrary to what may be often said. So I believe that using <coughs> specialists who currently are in secondary care and tertiary care, I believe that using those and, and being able to cooperate, the cooperation between the secondary, the tertiary, and the primary care in the setting of a polycare does have a great deal to offer, now, both in terms of quality, in terms of equity of access, and probably, probably in terms of saving good life. Okay. Um, can I push you a little bit further then? Um, I thought, of course, I only have a tiny little map. But knowing that you are in contact with the great improvement of profession, I'm trying to understand, when I look at this map, which shows St. Mary's at one edge, I know you can't see, but this is one edge of this great huge area of two million people, really on the periphery. I'm, I'm told, half a mile away from UCH, which probably duplicates a lot of what St. Mary's does, except for the major trauma centre. <coughs> including, we've heard, down to having an HASU unit. Wouldn't it make more sense, having regard to the fact that but for the one ward in Paddington, the most deprived, the most uh, unequipped people are to the west of Northwest Thames. Wouldn't it make more sense to have your major, major centre somewhere in the middle well, at least a little bit away at home, perhaps, if not in Ealing, where geographically it might make sense, at least in Charing Cross, where it already is or has been. And if so, why is it called the same merit? So, the last bit, I can't really ask. I really don't know. The first bit about what might have been perceived to be the most useful set my view of the perception of the board probably was I wasn't influencing this at all because I did have to be very careful not to be partial because I was there uh, as 
representing another body. I wasn't there as a consultant. It was my perception that they probably thought that that central uh, location for all the services and emergencies would be West Hill Centre. That was my impression. Now, why not the Charing Cross? Well, crikey, you know, it's supposed to have been falling down due to concrete rot for the last 30 years. Um, the pediatrics and the maternity, the obstetric services, not there at all at Chelsea Westminster, proposed to be another central unit. So you could say that it was Charing Cross site was terminally disadvantaged before any further discussion went on. Can I just have a question to further? Um, I've, heard, I've, I've been told by a correspondent that Hammersmith Hospital was, going, was seriously considered. Uh, for example, that had medical expertise, certainly. It had good buildings, and it had a lab, and would not be owned by the NHS, and if not, contiguous land, which could be acquired, as opposed to, say, Barrett's, which has difficult transport links, old buildings, etc. In your experience in medical politics, do you know what happened to that Hammersmith proposal? I do know that the original Hammersmith yeah. proposal. I do know that the original Hammersmith proposal was actually many years ago. Um, when I did have something to do with with um, the disposition of services. This is long before shaping that health and this, this is 15 years ago. And indeed, there was a very comprehensive plan drawn up by the old Hammersmith Hospitals Trust, as was, to redevelop the Hammersmith Hospital site, including a station, including a separate slip road from the A40, um, extensive car park. All kinds of things, shops, gyms, swimming pools. This was in the heady days before the crash, I think. Uh, so there was certainly that plan. What happened to it, I don't know. Part of it, the first part of it, I think, was to develop a ring here on the house inside, the diocese, um, which, of course, has been very successful. But I don't know. I have to keep an eye on the clock, I'm afraid, because there's probably at least.